Jeff was Premier of Victoria from 1992 to 1999. He was the President of the Hawthorne Football Club from 2005 to 2011. And that's a pretty important role here in Victoria, President of one of our football clubs. He's also the Founding Chairman of Beyond Blue, a national anti-depression initiative. And during his term as Premier, he reduced the number of councils from 210 to 78. So please welcome Jeff Kennan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Bill, very much indeed. And uh, your introduction proves one thing. You survived. <laughs> and often people are quite clearly very afraid of change, they think of self, they think of today, and they have great difficulty trying to think of where they may be in 10 years' time. As you know, I have always thought long-term rather than short-term. I've always thought that our responsibility, whether you be at state or council level of government, is trying to position where your communities want to be 10, 15, 20 years from today and what is the best way of getting there. I've never really thought that compromise is anything but an excuse for weakness, although a lot of people believe politics is the art of compromise, I tend to differ from that point of view. Not to say that you can't change at the edges, the margins from time to time, but invariably to me compromise runs the risk of reducing the long-term outcome and benefit of what you're on about. I only heard the tail end of Felicity's uh, address to you a moment ago, and there are probably going to be very many common themes over this uh, period of this seminar, and as you work your way through uh, the next few months and potentially the next three years. For those of us who are Victorian-based, it is true to say that we probably have the strongest system of local government in Australia. And I don't say that parochially, <coughs> but we made changes that were deemed to be necessary some years ago and that has given us a very strong base today and as I move around the country and I was in Western Australia on Monday, continually it comes up how our reforms in local government have positioned our industry better than any others. Having said that, there will always be changes put in front of us by those who uh, live above us by that I mean state governments and federal governments, and there will be increasing demand from those we are elected to serve, being our communities. But the reality is, short of something happening that I can't envisage at the moment, local government is here to stay. All the talk about changing the three-tier structure is all talk, and the opportunity to bring it about almost impossible. That's not to say that if you weren't starting again from scratch today, you wouldn't have a different system. You would. You'd only have two tiers of government. Probably federal and a more expanded and more professional local government sector. The need for state government, I don't think, would exist today as it existed in the past. But as we are seeing, uh, we are always subject to imposition. And for councils around Australia, the decisions by the federal government that announced in the budget the other day are going to have profound effects on our ability to manage. Uh, about 25% a quarter, some a bit more of our revenue comes as allocations from the federal government and if they're going to cap the growth of those funds over the next three years, that's going to cost us all about 10-11% on that quarter or 30%, whatever it is that each council gets from federal government. That is a lot of money and it is going to have to be addressed. The associations can argue against it, federally, collectively, alone. But whether the federal government will alter what they've brought down, I very much doubt. So we can either argue against what's happened or we can start preparing for what's going to occur from July the 1st. Secondly, for those of you who are Victorian councils, we have another threat hanging over our head, which will be decided by the electorate in November, because one of the political parties has 
as part of their policy offering, said that they'll freeze council rates for their first term. So if you get a combination of a freezing of by indexation of the funds you get from Commonwealth combined with an actual freezing of your own rate capacity, then we're in for an Armageddon uh, in terms of your ability to manage, which will very severely impact on your communities and impact very quickly. We're fortunate, and I don't say this because we're under the auspices of the MAB here, but our local government organisation in Victoria again is stronger and probably more respected than any other association anywhere else in Australia. So from a position, a starting gate position, councils here are in a fairly good position in terms of their capacity, in terms of their organisation and of course in part because of their leadership. As you know, and I declare this as I do every time I attend a council function these days, that I've taken on the role of chairman of an organisation called CT Management that deals with councils and helps them in a whole range of specific areas, and many of you we deal with now. But the benefit of that is it's given me a better understanding of the financial condition of our councils here in Victoria and many around Australia, and particularly. Uh, the juggernaut that's going to hit the councils in New South Wales very quickly based on their uh, Auditor General's report that came out last year, which is quite horrific. But when you even look at our councils here, and we've had a couple of councils who have been removed for a range of reasons, there are some that are definitely struggling. There's a middle group, as I call them, that like many of the community are keeping their heads above water, and then there's a few at the top end who are big enough and manage well enough that are in a fairly sound position. But with the two changes, if we just take the two that I've enunciated, if the two changes were to occur, that is going to change the mix very, very quickly indeed. And that might actually present for government the necessity <coughs> to think again about their relationships with local government. From local government's point of view, it's going to be a very real opportunity for those who observe local government to test the quality of management. Because in the end, I suspect, it's going to be about political will. And practices of the past, more of the same, are not going to work over the next three or four years. Both elected representatives and their senior officers from today or yesterday or whenever the budget was brought down have got to understand that the change starts on July the 1st. And I've always hoped that what we've done in Victoria, the way in which we've worked with the MAV, keeps local government just slightly ahead of the curve. Well, the curve's all of a sudden had a huge uplift and there's a little mountain ahead of us. And if we don't address that mountain, as Felicity said, unless we explain to the public why we're going to make some changes, then we're going to find ourselves many more councils are going to be totally financially embarrassed. To the point where many of the elected representatives are going to have to ask themselves whether they are overseeing an insolvent operation. And you all understand the legal risks of that. So, local government however testing it may have been over the last two or three years, will be nothing compared to what you're going to have to address in the next three. If only the federal government measures come into play, let alone Victorian councils, if there is a change of government. Not that I advocate a change, I think you'd all understand. But you can't deny the fact that the electorate does funny things on many occasions. So what should you be doing? What do I think you should be doing? Because I could be entirely wrong. But I think every council now has got to understand that by the time you bring down this year's budget, so that doesn't give you much time at all, you've got to do a power of work to start identifying the services that you should no longer be providing, the services that you have got to change, You've got to, as I said at a council before, a council meeting before, when you have a look at the superannuation 
levy that you've all had imposed upon you, for some more financially embarrassing than others, that financial levy has not only been part of a reduction in the funds earned by the fund, the interest earned by the fund, but it's also been about the cost escalation within councils. And that cost escalation has been well above CPI. So part of the reason you got those levies was because you were spending more than was justified given inflation in the environment in which we live. But I was making the point two or three months ago that if I was in the council today, I would be putting out an edict that we not only don't grow by more than CPI, we actually try and grow our expenses by 1% less than CPI to give us a buffer. Now that goes to salary increases, it goes to people we employ, it goes to all of those sorts of things. If councils haven't started to address that particular issue now, you're behind the eight ball. And I sus suspect there are many who haven't because it's too hard. Because the politicians among councils don't want to make the tough decisions. Well, you're going to be found out. If you're trying to be nice and polite, if you're trying to live the easy life, in the next 12 months, those who are weak, those who compromise, will fail. <coughs> those who do the work, the hard yards, identify the things that have to be addressed and do so, will survive. Might be tough but we're all going to go through this whatever level of government we're at. So I've asked or suggested before we should have already started addressing this issue of cost, labour costs within our council. And these 8% increases that we've been experienced over the last two or three years are not sustainable. We've got to get back to CPI. If I was you, I'd get back slightly less. All right, that gives us then the second weapon in our armoury, and that is the level of services that we provide. Felicity alluded to it, I think, when she said that over the last few years, local government have been expected to provide more and more in the social welfare area to our communities. Of course, many councillors are elected on single issues like providing a neighbourhood house or something of this nature, and invariably, the single issue wins the support of the majority and council extends the sort of services it provides. So we've got to go back to core. And we've got to go back to core very, very quickly. And we've got to take our communities with us. Because in the moment, right now, under the regime here in Victoria, you do have the right to set your own rates. You may not be able to do that from January the 1st. You may be stuck where you are and a reduction in your federal funding in real terms. So this issue of services becomes terribly important. What is your core? Identify your core, promulgate your core, talk to your community about it, and tell them why you're having to make the changes. There's a lot of argument at the moment about the federal budget. And it's around the community not understanding the narrative that the federal government haven't sold the story clearly enough. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. In one sense, I keep calling the previous government, and please, those of you who are, don't think for a moment that I'm politically partisan, but just take this on board. I call them arsonists. They actually set the fire that created this deficit and debt issue. They came to government with no government debt at all. And now we have this enormous debt which is growing every day because programs they've put in, which this new government has, in my opinion, unwisely agreed to continue to fund. So we're paying $30 million a day in interest, rising. We now hear that the arsonists are going to make sure that some of the provisions of these budgets are going to be thrown out in the Senate for reasons of political popularity or, as they describe it, unfairness. So you've got the arsonists lighting the bloody fire, and now they're stopping the fire and getting into the fire to try and put it out. So what does that mean? It means simply that the period that we're in deficit, which was estimated to be four or five years, if this happens, is likely to be eight or nine. Our debt will keep rising. Our interest rates that we pay 
will continue to increase, therefore giving us less disposable money to spend on things that the community would expect. My message to you is learn from what's happening in Canberra. Do the work very quickly and start communicating with your community about the changes you're going to have to make. Otherwise you're going to be hoisted on your own financial petard to the point where you may as elected representatives be running an insolvent organisation. And don't think that you can go back to the state and ask for savings. They won't save it. They haven't got the resources. And what you may have to do is what Bruce Matheson threatened to do when he became a director at Carlton Football Club, is return the keys to government. But just understand your legal liability because it's going to come into play and councils may have to surrender the keys if you are not solvent. So my first message after asking you to think about your labour costs is actually then to think about the messages that you're going to have to talk to your community about. And the councils are going to have to work together. You don't want to see brave councillors out there supporting the community against the majority. If ever there's a time when elected councillors have got to work together in the common interests of their community, now is the time. Smart, independent, publicity-seeking councillors who put at risk the work being done by the majority are just not warranted and could actually destroy what you have to do. So you need to have people around you, you need to have a communication strategy, you need to work through your mayor to make sure that the community understands that you are coming, you are being caught in a pincer movement. And if council is going to survive in order to grow, you can't waste a day or a week and you must be ready to introduce your reforms in your next budget, not in 2015. <coughs> By way of services, in some of the work that we've done at the CT with some of the councils. For instance, uh, one council has, is in the business of public golf courses. Now, I don't understand that. It's not called business. Now, I can understand maybe retaining one and doing it well, but why would you keep three when there are also private golf courses in the area? Either sell them off, redevelopment, do what has to be done. But it's an example of where I think you've got to understand what is the core business of council. Another council I know uh, have got involved in providing neighbourhood housing and staffing neighbourhood houses. Now that is admirable, but it's very, very expensive. And is it core business? It may be. But council have got to sit down and go through every service you provide and address this issue as to whether it's core business or not and start to adjust quickly. There's a lot of councils. I'm very, uh, I admire very much the new Premier of New South Wales when he was Treasurer, Mike Baird. He came from a political family but he's not a politician. He was in the financial industry before he went in. And one of the things he did in New South Wales was set about identifying all of their assets and getting rid of the assets that were either underutilised or not utilised or were no longer wanted. And he's raised billions of dollars, which he's attributed to either writing down debt or to applying what he considers, and now as Premier, they consider to be the core business of New South Wales. Every council in Victoria should be doing that, every council in Australia should be doing it and be doing it before your next budget. What assets do you have that you don't need? I'm not suggesting you start a fire sale, but I suggest, and most councils in Victoria have a very good idea of what your asset base is, but if you look at that asset base, like those golf courses, is it core business? Assets in areas worth a lot of money a lot of money be, can be secured from the sale of those assets if that was the council decision. Every asset, your register, should be open to council and a very tough-nosed approach needs to be taken in assessing the values and the need of those assets longer term. That then will help identify the asset requirement. 
Now, we've always argued, and we've worked with many of you, to deliver what we call a sustainable 10-year business program. Again, I think because you've got to think 10 years as a minimum time frame. Anything shorter, you're almost making decisions uh, on a whim of a prayer. But it may be now, because of what we're heading into, that if you look at the services that you're providing and make alterations, if you look at your assets, you then can review the assets required. You then can have a look at the infrastructure required over the next 10 years. You can then review the renewable gap in terms of maintaining assets and providing infrastructure in the future. And for those councils who are country, rural, regionally based, where so much of their assets gets put into roads, etc. You know, the first thing that the community always looks and complains about is the quality of the roads that they move around their electorates or their councils on. So, services can lead to a change, a prioritisation. That will lead to perhaps a change in the requirement of providing assets to provide some of those services and certainly recurrent expenditure. And then thirdly, you get the opportunity as a result of that change to actually look at the renewable gap that may have been established over uh, and for the next 10 years. Now, I don't want any of you to think I'm pessimistic about the future. I'm not. But I do think we've got to be realistic. And that's, I think, the message that must come out of today. I think it was the message that Felicity was imparting and certainly the message that I impart. There's no question councils have a future. The question is how many of them are going to be there and, importantly, in what condition <coughs> they're going to be. The number may reduce because a number failed. And therefore, governments are going to take the keys back and rejig the boundaries. I don't think in Victoria there's going to be a restructuring of councils per se, although, as some of you know, I've always thought or have thought for a number of years now that the city of Melbourne should be bigger to take in those areas that are now part of the city. But beyond that, I don't believe in a general restructure. In New South Wales, I have no doubt there will be a reorganisation of councils after the next election. In Western Australia, they're trying to do it by voluntary amalgamations, and you know how well they go down. Uh, I remember how many of the Victorian councils put their hands up here, one to voluntary amalgamate some years ago, none. Uh, no, and one. Which one was that? It was Rutherglen and Chilton trying to amalgamate. Bugger me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. No, no one told me, it's my defence. Uh, and then you've got the situation uh, in Queensland where they've had amalgamations but they didn't achieve the same synergies we have and there's been a couple of breakaways. I think there's five councils now going through the process of looking at realignment, etc. All of that is periphery to this new challenge that's now been dropped on us from Canberra last week. And the real challenge is whether the councils, the councillors, are politically strong enough to actually do what's required. And that remains the big challenge. If they are, I don't fear the future of local government. If they, are, if they don't have the political courage, then I do fear. And I think you'll see the manifestation of that occur fairly quickly. Uh, I hope the state government backs councils to the hilt. I hope that the government today doesn't fall for this two-card trick of trying to match Labor's promise of denying you the ability to set your own rates over the next three years. Because if that were to happen, then the sorts of issues we're referring to now are going to magnify themselves dramatically overnight. It, it denies you any flexibility at all to actually not only do what I've said, to readjust, rearrange, prepare, but it will actually deny you the opportunity to continue in many cases to continue to represent your communities as you have in the past. Now, can I just come back and close, and I don't know, John, whether you want to take a few questions, answers and abuse, I'm very used to it, as you know. Uh, but I just want to go back to this second point I mentioned, that is the one of communication. Uh, it is terribly important when you're going through change. Not everyone's going to agree with everything you do. But if you put out a message that makes sense, 
then the majority of the public will understand. And can I say, it's not much value attacking. So you, it's not much point attacking the federal government and using up your energy on attacking them for what they've done. In the same way that if there's a change of government, but it's certainly something you can use in your communication, if there were to be a change of government, which is, from Labor's point of view, they see it as a political asset, right? There's very few councils, there's very few councillors, there's only a few CEOs, there's a lot of public voters out there. So go to the public and say, well, we're going to freeze your rates, that's politically appealing. So they're not likely to change their position. But you've got time to actually say to the public, not in a part politically partisan way, but just trying to understand and explain to your electorate, to your rate payers, what may happen with the combination of what's occurring federally and what may happen here in the state in terms of your capacity <coughs> to be able to continue to provide the services that you currently do. And because you've already known half of the equation, as already said, you have a responsibility to act in advance of being in a position where you lose all flexibility when you get absolutely square, uh, squeezed. So, most of you, I suspect, will not have among your ranks good communicators. You run the risk, therefore, of putting out messages that are received the wrong way or actually infuriate your ratepayers, therefore applying some pressure on some of the weaker councillors to oppose the changes that are necessary. Go back to what I said before. Compromise, in my opinion, leads to weaker outcomes. If you do the work over the next few weeks and actually identify the sorts of things that I've talked about today, if you get councils committed to it, then you've got to make sure you stick together. It's not going to be easy. No change is. But it's what leadership requires. And unfortunately, leadership, in my opinion, in this country on most levels have been compromised for the last few years. As people give in for the wrong reasons which have shortened our ability to stand strong. Please, if you do not have good communicators among your ranks, don't hesitate to go to the MAV or someone else and reach out and get someone to give you advice. Don't lose the battle before you even start by putting out stuff that's going to be misinterpreted or send the wrong message. Advocacy still is the strongest weapon you have. It is the strongest weapon. It costs very little, but simple messages, well put, are going to be well received. Convoluted messages can cause chaos. Having said all of that, I'd still rather be where we are today facing the challenges than not here at all. And that's the alternative. And it's not very pleasant. So, this is a bump. And this bump, and maybe a second bump, are going to identify the best CEOs and the best engineers and the best councils and the best councillors. Not a bad test. It could be a bit of fun. But you haven't got time on your side. You've got to your next budget. That means the work's got to be done now and when you return to your councillors, those with authority should be insisting that council comes together quickly, out of session, start doing the work, start working with the CEO, and then start communicating. Have a good day. Go boys. Questions? Yes, in the front here, please. Can you identify yourself? And... Yeah, I'm Joanne Burgess, um, West Australian Local Government Association. We're going through some groups there. Um... Yeah, I was there on Friday, Monday. How's, how's uh, voluntary evaluations going? Well, boundary adjustments going perfectly. <laughs> Not. Not. Um, so I was wondering, um, with your, your talk about uh, core uh, services, your thoughts on, given that, about own source funding, should we be concentrating mainly on getting back to core, or is there a place for own source funding through commercial activity? Uh, I don't think there's any opposition to either. Uh, to be quite honest, the understanding that commercial operations run risks. And therefore, if you're going to go to 
commercial operations is maybe the council themselves are not the best people to be making. In other words, you've got to reach out and get good advice. Uh, I don't mind running risks. I love running risks. But you've got to base them on good evidence. And if the evidence is there, then I would say go for it. I mean, just remember, you know you're going to lose your indexation, so you know what that's worth for every council. You can work that out pretty quickly. So there's a sum of money that you've got to find immediately in order to protect the three years. For Victorian councils, if you were to lose the ability to set your rates, even at CPI, you know what that's worth. So you've got to find that immediately as well. That'll focus the mind. But if you're thinking of going into commercial operations now, knowing that they take some time to build up and need a capital investment, you've got to work out the capital investment versus the so-called returns and when they come into play. And that'll be a different issue altogether. Where there are commercial operations that are working, how you ramp them up, very importantly. The other thing is, of course, it does, again, bring into light this issue of shared services among councils. Uh, particularly among some of the smaller ones. Uh, the, these, this cost pressure you're going to face is so great that many of the rural provincial councils are not going to be able to do it on their own. So they are going to have to look around for shared services, regional type models. Otherwise I fear that the smaller will suffer. Jackie down the front here. You know Jackie, MAV board. Jack for Stanky City of Yarramir. Um, of course, uh, on that last question, uh, councils did have uh, commercial operations in terms of electricity, and they were sold off, and that would have uh, helped us with our, um, uh, with our, with our funding uh, issues. But uh, the key issue question I want to raise is that uh, our, our federal system, and you commented on that, uh, and the issue with the federal government so raising 84% of the taxation in the country of the various types of taxes, states 14% and local government 3% uh, and not that, not being matched with services. And uh, I, my question to you is uh, how you see that changing and uh, how that, um, that struggle is going to be dysfunctional. Um, how you see that change? Uh, just on your first point, Jackie, you're quite right. Uh, electricity authorities were bought from you, uh, but don't forget the other side of the coin as to whether councils were going to have the capacity to continue to provide the infrastructure, which was the whole issue of privatisation. We as a government didn't have the money to keep investing in new equipment and new systems and light poles and everything else. Uh, read the second. I understand that, but I, I tend to deal with the reality of life, uh, not against the impossibility of life. So it's why I say, I'd love to have two tiers of government. Is it likely to happen? No, so why waste energy? Right? Like no, no, but you're talking about the taxation system. Yes, yeah, yeah, but the same applies to taxation. Right? It's unlikely that anything you do or the organisation does nationally is going to change the federal government's way in which they collect and then redistribute money. Right? I, I see no indication that either side of politics are interested in it. And the problem councils have always had is that you are part of a federal structure where the federal government, through taxation, fundamentally dominates, uh, and increasingly so. So I don't think there's any likelihood that there's going to change. And you can argue the case till the cows come home, but I think what's more important right now is to actually address the changes that have been imposed on us by others, but also the sorts of things that we've been doing over the last few years that have been, in my opinion, slowly. And by that I mean particularly seeing our labour costs rise by 8%. That's unsustainable. And that's just where councils have given in to pressures, <coughs> employment, salaries, levels. Work on the things that you know you're going to face. The advocacy is fine, keep the associations advocating, I don't think anyone's going to be answering your door in Canberra in the short term. Yeah, it's a bit like whether you want the microphone is going, it's a bit like whether the council should be in the constitution or not. I mean, 
you all feel strongly about it. There's been no real indication from either side of politics that they're going to support it. So, you know, how much energy are you going to put into that as opposed to delivering what you're meant to be delivering efficiently and effectively? Yes. Hi, my question. I'm Karen Lewis from Mount Morris Shire Council. My question is about core and non-core and how we define that. So, you had the traditional growth rates and rubbish. Then I would say most council plans look at natural, social, environmental, and economic, so it's very broad now. What's your thoughts or advice on how we scope or re-scope or define what's core for councils? Uh, I firstly say that every council will be different. No two councils are necessarily the same. Uh, but secondly, that is the challenge that you as a group of people, as councillors or administrators, are going to have to decide within your own council. It's, it's more important than the management of your own funds, because you're dealing with public funds. I always say that being in state government, my, the way I manage the people's money with my team was more important than how I manage my money. If I blew my own money, well, that's my fault, and I'll pay the penalty. When I'm dealing with the public's money, I have a responsibility to be a lot more cautious, not to lose an entrepreneurial spirit, but actually to understand where my obligations lie. So I think that's why, if I was you with due respect, and your council, and you may have done, I'd go back and I'd ask the CEO, give me a list of all the things that we spend money on in terms of services. Right? We know we've got to save X million dollars from July the 1st. How are we going to do it? And you're going to have to make some hard decisions. That's why I say the communication to community is very important. So I'm not saying you shouldn't be in childcare or you shouldn't be in neighbourhood houses or you shouldn't be in golf courses. I am saying that every council is going to have to assess their own activity. You can't write about it. What's going to happen with superannuation? The run since you got the last call, the last call from uh, the authorities to top up the funds, the superannuation has been returning a much higher dividend. So from the point of view of the fund receiving better interest and payment, that's not going to be a problem, I don't think, in this three years unless something happens very, very quickly, adverse to what is currently occurring. But the other side of the agenda, which is the labour costs that go into the consideration of whether the fund is fully funded or not, will play a part. So if you haven't already moved on that, you're at risk. Now you've got the other issue, which is the federal government. I don't, I don't know your council, I don't know what you're spending money on, but that'll be a decision for you and your colleagues to make. There is no one core service that I think stands out any more than anything else. Just ask yourself, where are we going to save this money? Then you've got to make the case. All changes. Anyone else? Yep, one final one here, Jeff. Okay, Jeff, Dan Hagen from Melbourne City Council. Um, you've advocated cutting community services, you've advocated selling community assets. My rates are less than my mobile phone bill or my Foxtel bill. At what point does raising rates become a legitimate, uh, legitimate uh, tool in greater financial sustainability for the sector? Well, you could ask that of life generally. I mean, what right? <laughs> We're all working here under the cone of silence, no doubt. But what right as a federal government to freeze your expenditure for three years? Right? Well, not freeze your expenditure. Freeze the amount of money they're giving you annually when their own expenditure is going to rise by 12% the same period of time. What right have any of us <coughs> got in terms of some of our management when we see our water bills going up by 25%? So there are these vagaries in life the whole time. I always think that council rates are a very valuable tool, right? Uh, but you know the biggest cry from community at the moment <coughs> is not over their rates of taxation or anything else. It's actually over <coughs> utility charges. So gas, water, uh, other things that are killing them. And in many councils where the rate rises substantially above CPI, they get whacked as well. So council has to balance the need for the rate rise and the provision of service against how the community is going to work when they can tolerate it. And that's one of the biggest challenges we face. But just, and, and, and if you can, if that is denied you, so if the 
change of government were to occur here and they put into place no rate rises above CPI, well, that only reinforces exactly what I'm saying about the need to cut your cloth pretty quickly. If they freeze rates and deny your CPI, then you're going to have a 10 to 12 to 15 percent real reduction over the next three years from rates alone, let alone what the federal government is imposing upon you. So it is. It's a it's a massive, massive, massive change. Now I've never contemplated, well we never contemplated years ago, uh, after we put the restructuring in, I think we freeze, froze rates for two years, didn't we? Uh, while we put the synergies in place, then we returned the councils and then we gave them the flexibility. But beyond that, we never contemplated freezing the rates because it removes from those you've asked for a minister of group, one of the only leaders they've got to try and manage their affairs. If their rates go up 9%, for instance, a year, that could be an indication of some very major infrastructure that wishes to be provided, might be justified. On the other hand, it might represent inefficiency. It might get, uh, represent uh, loose management. Could be different. So, uh, all I know, all I know is what's coming towards me. There's a train, and it's telling me I'm going to have a reduction in the monies I have allocated from the federal government. I've got to adjust to manage that quickly, otherwise it's going to have a multiplier effect. If the other happens, and it may well may, because that's the nature of politics, then the impact of the second will be greater than the first. So imagine if that came into place and you hadn't even addressed the first. And the second could occur in November. So they could put it into place from January or January the 1st next year or maybe July the 1st, don't know. That's why I say I think this budget cycle now is terribly important. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Great pleasure. Bill, you're a survivor. I hope you get through the next three years. Uh, thank you all very much indeed. Look, as I say, I don't mean to be pessimistic. I'm not. I hope I'm realistic. I think it's a very challenging period. There are going to be some tough decisions that have to be made, but with due respect, when you offer yourself for public office, that's part of the responsibility you take on board. You're not there to be the most popular person in the world. You're actually there to serve your community. And sometimes you've got to do things that even you, based on good advice and good evidence, would rather not to do. Have a great day. Stay well.